Hi everyone, my name is Teddy McCormack and I'm so excited to share with you my project on the spatial distribution of bison wallows, a geospatial analysis of wallow sites in Genesee Park, Colorado. I want to give a shout out to my mentor Emma and Dr. K K Karen Bailey for all their feedback and support this summer. So American bison once roamed North America in a population sizes between 30 and 60 million. Their mass slaughter by colonial settlers left their populations in the mere thousands, and now bison occupy less than 1% of their historic range. Their near extinction and habitat loss has led to gaps in understanding how their ecological, um, how they affect their landscapes today. Before I get into my project, I want to just acknowledge that the ecological restoration and conservation of bison is inextricably tied to the reclamation reclamation of land to indigenous peoples and um, the return of these animals to their original caretakers. I will be using the terms buffalo and bison interchangeably throughout my project um, as it is the nomenclature used in the Intertribal Buffalo Council and by several tribal nations. So most of what we know about bison ecology focuses on the free-ranging herds in tall grass prairies. There are less than five studies done on bison in Colorado, and there's a major gap in research on spatially restricted herds, which I'll be looking at for my project, in Montan grassland environments. Bison are amazing keystone species that impact the landscape in several different ways, and one of these ways is by increasing ecosystem heterogeneity or diversity. One of the ways they do this is by grazing on dominant plant species like brome um, and allowing other species to thrive as they don't have to compete for resources like sunlight or water. Um, they also provide a variation of grass heights that allow for small mammals and other species to have increased habitat areas. Um, they also increase ecosystem heterogeneity through a mo the movement of nutrients. So through their excrements, um, they actually increase the total availability of nitrogen and phosphates in the environment, which kind of act as food for plants and soil microbes. My favorite and arguably the most uh, adorable behavior in which they <laughs> these bison increase ecosystem heterogeneity is through wallowing. So wallowing is a term used to describe a behavior in which they roll around on their backs um, to shed hair, insects, and even as a social behavior um, during rut. But I've seen bison of all ages engage in this behavior. Uh, what's really cool about uh, wallows is that it creates large patches of dirt, often with coarse soil in the center. Um, and this changes the species composition and nutrient availability um, around the wallow sites, and this is different than the adjacent grasslands surrounding them. So like I said, wallowing changes the soil pH and composition, which allows for differences in plant species diversity around the wallows. And I think that understanding the spatial distribution of wallows could reveal potential habitat uh, or bison habitat preferences for wallowing. And so looking at this in relation to slope, elevation, and aspect could be helpful. So my objective is to use QGIS to understand the spatial distribution of bison wallows in Genesee Park, Colorado. So I made this map in QGIS, and this shows our study area, which is in Genesee, Colorado, about 20 minutes west of the Denver metro area. We will be looking at um, north and middle pasture, which are on either side of I-70. So north pasture is about 102 acres and middle pasture is about 157 acres. There are currently 24 adults and 19 calves for a total of 43 bison in the park. And the park sits at 7,743 feet in elevation. So here are some images that I took um, on the ground in middle pasture of some wallows. But I didn't really think that they captured exactly how massive some of these sites can be and just how irregular the shapes can be. So I wanted to take some aerial imagery of some of the wallows. Um, these are also in middle pasture. These ones right here are some of the largest that I saw um, during my time in the pastures. As you can see, they're quite irregular. Um, just for like scale, that's me right there. So they're pretty large. Um, and this trail connecting 
actually right here is created by the bison. So you can see that they return to these wallow sites um, again and again, and that's how they form this irregular shape that's not really circular. Um, so for this project, I collected a total of 68 wallow sites by walking the pastures in a couple of hours. Uh, the location data was recorded for all of them. And then I inputted this data into QGIS and overlaid it with a digital elevation model, or DEM, and then extracted uh, location data like uh, slope, elevation, and aspect for each of the sites. I then created maps and histograms to understand the spread of these sites visually and to further analyze them. So the first one, as we can see, um, this is in meters, it's not mentioned here, but um, 68 of the wallow sites across both pastures. We can see that they are majorly, they're legally, little, little, sorry, I'm nervous. Um, <laughs> they're in this like lighter orange and like darker orange, um, most commonly. But the total range and elevation across these sites was 315 feet, which is about the same height as the Statue of Liberty. Um, the minimum wallow elevation found was 7,566 feet, and the max being 7,881 feet. So from graphing this data, we can see that it's a somewhat normal distribution, which is in, indicated by this bell-shaped curve right here. So I did find that the majority of the wallows were um, situated around that median elevation of 7,736 feet. Um, so this could suggest a preference for moderate elevations because when compared to this map of the pastures, it does fall between um, these uh, ranges right here. For slope, um, there wasn't that, the park overall was not that steep, um, but we do see that they fall between this four to eight degree range and eight to 12 degree range as it's in the yellow and lighter orange areas. But the median wallow slope was about 8.2 degrees. So 58.8% of wallow sites fell between 5 to 10 degrees in slope, which is not very steep at all in comparison to the boulder flat irons, which have a slope of about 55 degrees. This could indicate a preference for lower slopes. For aspect, um, aspect describes the direction that the slope faces. Um, so, for example, a south-facing slope gets more sunlight than a north-facing slope. And so here we can see there's quite a few of wallows in this western-facing slope area, and then a few in northeast as well as south. And so we did see this in the data, um, but I would like to continue doing research on this variable in particular because I think it could be interesting to investigate how the temperature of these different um, aspects could affect the wallow sites throughout the day. So in conclusion, my findings were somewhat consistent with a study done by Horn in 2024 that saw that bison wallows were commonly distributed in areas with lower slopes and higher elevations. However, my data found that wall wallows were at more moderate elevations um, and there was no clear trend between wallow sites and aspect. Um, I think further investigation could provide insights on that. And I would like to compare the spatial distribution of north and middle pasture against one another because I do think that there is a difference in availability of certain variables across the two pastures. Um, I also think it would be really interesting to incorporate analysis of tree cover. Um, and yeah, so overall, I think. We know a lot about how these wallows increase uh, ecosystem diversity, but understanding more about where they are in space and in the landscape could explain why and where the bison choose to wallow. Thank you. Thank you.